Again, good evening. My name is Paul O'Neill. On behalf of Kingston's Buried Treasures and the Wiltwick chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, I'd like to welcome you to the DAR House, Kingston's Crossroads of History. From one of our earliest settlers, Antoine Crispell, to the Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, the DAR House has played an integral role in the history of our community. Uh, through the good times and the bad times, the triumphs and the tragedies, uh, this house has stood firm. Its story is really our story. And we're very fortunate tonight to have as our featured presenter, uh, teacher, historian, community volunteer, and DAR member Nancy Shando. Uh, now many of you know Nancy and her love of history through her roles here at the DAR and as a member of the Board of Directors for the Friends of Historic Kingston, as well as her tours of, of Uptown Kingston and the Old Dutch Church Cemetery. Uh, but what you may not know is that Nancy has a very, very special relationship with this house. Uh, it's a very special relationship, uh, it's a very personal relationship, and she's the perfect person to tell us all about this special place. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce tonight's featured speaker, Nancy Shando. Thank you, Paul. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to thank the Wiltshire chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution for opening their chapter house, which is over 300 years old, for this Buried Treasures talk. So it's very special that our home is open this evening, and we're so happy that so many people came. Um, the DAR house sits on crossroads of Kingston's history, literally. Um, okay. Um, this triangular piece of land appears on early maps in the stockade designed by Dutch Governor Peter Stuyvesant. This triangular piece of land is between Crown and Green Street, and we can see it on a 1695 map of the stockade. If you look down on the lower, on the mid-left side, you see that triangle, and that's where we are today. Peter Stuyvesant ordered construction of the stockade and requested the local settlers move their homes inside of it for protection from the Native Americans. This street design is basically the same as it was in the early days. If these walls could talk, they would tell the story of the early history of Kingston, New York State, and the United States of America. The land and house here are of historical importance, but I believe the people who have owned and cared for this house are a large part of its history. Their history is also the history of this house. I researched and copied all the deeds for this house from the Ulster County Clerk's Office in the county building. I found that the deeds and the people they mention tell an interesting story that I would like to share with you this evening. This is a list of the owners of this home over the years. While researching them, I found something quite unusual for a house this old. I don't know that these connections have ever been made before, um, but every grantor was related to the grantee on every deed all through the years. This means each owner conveyed the home to a close member of their own family right up until the DAR ownership in 1907. As of 2015, the Slate family owned the property 70 years, the Tappan family 102 years, and the DAR so far for 108 years. These longtime homeowners took care of their property and passed it on to their family members to care for as well. This family ownership and concern for the home has contributed as much to the structure's survival as the sturdy construction of this building itself. The building has even been known in different centuries by the names of the owners. In the 18th century, it was known as the Slate House. In the 19th century, this building was known as the Tappan House. And in the 20th and 21st centuries, it has been known as the DAR House. Antoine Crispell was the first documented owner he owned this home from pre-1695 to 1705. New York State Archives date this home as circa 1670. This is a picture of the headstone of Antoine Crispell in the Old Dutch Church Cemetery in Kingston, New York. It's facing Main Street. 
Uh, the home during this time would have been a smaller structure. The oldest part of the house is believed to be the kitchen. And here you can see the large Dutch cooking fireplace with two original beehive ovens that can be seen on the outside wall on the Crown Street side. This part of the building has walls two feet thick. Uh, you can see that when you walk from the kitchen through the doorway into the dining room. The home today clearly shows a line um, just to the right of that gutter pipe where you can see the back half is the kitchen door with the beehive ovens and you can see the newer stone for the front construction of the home. The front of the house was an addition later. Antoine Crispel was a French Huguenot who settled in Wiltwick during the early days of the stockade. He left the stockade after a short period of time, possibly because county court records show that sometimes he didn't follow the rules of the stockade. I didn't even know the stockade had rules. He once appeared in court to face a charge of being outside the stockade after hours. Another time he had to appear in court because he provided alcohol to the Native Americans. And that was really not a good idea at all. He left the stockade to become one of the first settlers in Hurley, and then one of the original New Paltz patentees. But he didn't stay in either place. He returned to Kingston to live in the stockade for the rest of his life. He died in 1707, and that's when I, I think the timeline of him moving around gives us a date of uh, when this house was constructed. The last quarter of the 1600s, he was back in Kingston. So um, this is probably when he became the owner and the, um, and, uh, this dwelling on this property. He made a good living for himself through farming, milling, and mostly land acquisition. Another home that he owned was the Hoffman House. He conveyed that deed to his daughter, Janet G., when she married Nicholas Hoffman. It's through descendants of this family that Antoine Crispell is the fifth great-grandfather of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. When I researched the Crispell genealogy, I discovered that Antoine Crispell was closely related to the next two owners of this property as well, Mathis Van Curen and Hendrikus Slate. Mathis Van Curen owned this home from 1705 to 1735. He was married to Antoine Crispell's granddaughter, Trinchy Slate. He was a carpenter and was step-grandson, probable step-grandson of Thomas Chambers, also a carpenter, and founder of the Wiltwick Kingston Settlement. Van Curen conveyed the home to Hendrikus Slate, his brother-in-law, in 1735, and I have a picture of part of the deed, uh, and I did go up and make copies of all the deeds, and I just wanted to hold up a picture, a copy of what one of those old deeds looks like. And if you've never seen one from the county building, it's amazing to see the beautiful script and the wording used on those old deeds that we have in Ulster County. We're so lucky to have. This deed states, this indenture made the first day of March in the ninth year of the reign of our sovereign Lord George II by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King Defender of the Faith, in the year of our Lord, 1735, between Mathis Van Curen of Kingston in the county of Ulster, carpenter of the one part, and Hendrikus Slate of the same place, merchant of the other part. The deed goes on to state there is a dwelling house and barn with a lot of ground lying and being in Kingston, aforesaid being in a triangular form. The deed states that the property was sold for 120 pounds current money to him in hand and paid by the said Hendrikus Slate. So uh, I did want to make a copy of that deed. Mentioning King George just gives us a real feeling of how old the structure is. The next owner is Hendrikus Slate. He owned the house from 1735 to 1784. He was the son of Mary Magdalena Crispell and Mathis Slate. His mother was Antoine Crispell's daughter. He purchased the property that formerly belonged to his grandfather in 1735 from his brother-in-law, Van Curen. He was a merchant and he had a sloop on the Hudson River. He traveled between Albany and New York City, 
buying and selling various goods. Uh, the Senate House Museum has a copy of an order for him to bring glass from New York City for a customer here in Kingston, and, and I got to hold that and look at it in the Senate House over the summer. In 1736, Slate married Sarah Kirstead. The couple had three children, Hendrickus, born 1738, Helena, born 1739, and Hans, born 1741. By 1745, Slate was a successful merchant. He commissioned local portrait artist Peter Vanderlyn to paint the portrait of his six-year-old daughter, Helena. So this is the portrait that Peter Vanderlyn painted in 1745, most likely painted from life within this home. She was probably posing for that picture. Peter Vanderlyn was grandfather to the future and more famous John Vanderlyn. Many years later, in 1857, his grandson, John Vanderlyn Jr., painted a copy of that portrait of Helena Slate. The two portraits are owned by the Senate House Museum in Kingston, and they have been displayed side by side in the past, known as the two Helenas. And if you go to the Senate House website, you can click on the two Hel Helenas and the story and pictures of them comes up. I, I searched for portraits of the two sons of the Slates, but I couldn't find any. Uh, I don't know if he had his sons painted like he had his daughter done. Hendrickus Slate became a trustee of Kingston, and during the revolutionary years, he was the president of the trustees. He was a leader of the community. Records in the county archive show that the Charter of Kingston called for a public market. It was mentioned in the records of a Kingston trustee minutes that this public market was held at the Slate home. At this location, weights and measures were inspected, sellers and butchers were licensed, financial exchanges supervised, flour and meat inspected, and some prices were capped. Price of bread was listed and posted weekly according to the price of local flour. There was an order that each loaf be marked with the initials of the Christian and the surname of the baker. So this must have been a very busy place with people coming and going all the time back in those days. Hendrick Slate was the owner of the property on October 16, 1777, when the British soldiers burned Kingston, capital of New York. This home was burned along with most other structures. It suffered less damage than most, however. Most of the damage was to the wood trim, which needed to be replaced. Even that portrait of Helena Slate survived the burning of Kingston. A list of properties burned in 1777 states that Slate had two houses and one barn on this site. The house was quickly rebuilt and it is likely that George Washington made a visit to this home when he came to Kingston in 1782. Since Hendrickus Slate was president of the trustees, he was designated to meet George Washington on his way into Kingston from Hurley. <coughs> Slate made a welcome speech to Washington, who later mentioned that he greatly appreciated Slate's words. It's known that George Washington dined at the home of Dirk Winecoop on the corner of Green and Main Streets a short distance away. So it's likely then that Washington, being respectful of Slate's position as village president, would have called on Hendrickus Slate at this home. The home probably reached its current size and appearance during the time of Slate's ownership. This is a little bit wider angle of the Crown Street side of the house, showing next to that gutter pipe um, the line between the old stone and the newer stone. Um, this is a five-bay Georgian colonial home. That design became popular in the mid to latter half of the 18th century during the years that Slate owned the house. It was certainly a fitting residence for the president of the trustees. And this is an old postcard that I found. Of course, it wasn't taken during Slate's time because there were no pictures back then. But this is probably the picture I could find that's the closest to what the house would have looked like back then. It's before, definitely before the Myron Teller renovation with the little front porch on the front. Now the next owner of the house was Helena Slate Jansen. She owned the house from 1784 
1805, she's the little girl that was in that portrait, now grown up. In 1784, Hendrickus Slate conveyed the property to his daughter, Helena, the wife of Henry Jansen. And this is part of that deed, and it says, in quote, in consideration of the sum of 400 pounds lawful money to him in hand, paid by Helena Jansen, the receipt which the said Hendrickus Slate doth hereby acknowledge for further consideration of the outward love and affection which he hath and beareth unto the said Helena Jansen, his daughter, unquote. Those are quite unusual words for a legal document in those days, and even in these days, I would think it's quite unusual. There's no mention of his sons. He had a son, Hans, who was alive at this time. For sure, I found him living in New York City, and I don't know um, where the other son, Hendrickus, was at this time. I couldn't find him. It's been said now that since Helena Jansen was the owner of this home, she threw Henry Jansen's clothes out into the street. Which street? Could it be Crown Street or Green Street? Or maybe both. But maybe the legend is that she could have thrown his clothes out into the street because she, not her husband, was the sole owner of this house, which was somewhat rare in those days, but not unheard of for the Dutch. Henry Jansen died in 1794. His wife, Helena, lived until 1819. They are buried in the old Dutch uh, church cemetery, and their stone is facing the Wall Street side. Helena and Henry Jansen had eight children. In 1805, Helena conveyed the property to John R. Tappan for the sum of 1,500 New York dollars in hand. He was her son-in-law. He, he was married to her daughter, Sarah. Um, no, she didn't deed the house to her daughter like her father had done. She turned it over to a son-in-law but her father had signed it over to her alone. She did have a clause in that deed, however, that says, quote, she could reserve a room as she might choose in sound dwelling for and during her lifetime. She lived to be 80 years old, and so I assume that she lived her whole life in this house. The next owner of the home was John R. Tappan. He owned it from 1805 to 1831. He was born in Kingston in 1766 to Christopher Tappan, deputy county clerk under George Clinton and revolutionary patriot and his wife Anna Jean Winecoop. He married Sarah Jansen, daughter of Helena and Henry in 1791. John Tappan was a successful lawyer practicing in Kingston. In 1805, his mother-in-law conveyed her house to him. He soon gave up the practice of law and became editor and publisher of the Ulster Plebeian, a leading newspaper from 1813 until his death in 1831. I found this copy of the Ulster Plebeian in the Senate House Museum. It's dated January 30th, 1819, and it was a big paper like the size of the Kingston Daily Freeman. Um, under the banner head of the Ulster Plebeian, I found it interesting. It says, printed and published by John Tappan opposite the post office. <laughs> the printing and publishing office of the newspaper was in this house on the second floor, right over where we are tonight. The large, oh, there was a door built on the west side of the second story of this home with an outdoor staircase. And this is a modern day picture, but on the upper Right, this is the Green Street side. Um, we believe that's most likely where there was a door with an outdoor staircase. Um, the large Elmendorf house was directly across Green Street, and it had an annex on the north side, which served as the post office during the Tappan publishing years. The newspaper could then easily be taken down this outside staircase and delivered across Green Street to the post office, where it would be sent to subscribers all around Ulster County. The room that held the heavy printing press still shows evidence of its weight today. The center window sills on the north side of that room upstairs slant in towards the center of the room to this day. And um, you're welcome to take a walk up there and take a look at that later. 
John Tappan also ran a book and stationery store for a time in this building. It was in the lower front corner room on the Green Street side of the house. So this was a busy place during his years as well. During these John Tappan years, the home seems to have been in its prime of usefulness and beauty. A booklet called Old Gardens in Kingston, written by artist Julia McEntee Dillon, describes, quote, a beautiful garden in the rear of the structure. Besides that garden, the house was noted for its winter garden in front, and its many windows always filled with beautiful flowering plants, a joy to the passerby, unquote. John Tappan died in 1831. He was said to have been a man of fine talents, integrity, and an exemplary Christian. He's also said to have worked so tirelessly for the Ulster plebeian as to seriously impair his health and lead to his premature death. He did not have a will at the time of his death, so the home was then owned by his wife, Sarah Jansen Tappan, and his four children, Peter, Henry, John J., and Sarah C. Tappan. Now, several different Tappan family members owned the home over the next many years, from 1831 to 19, 1896. By 1851, it was owned by Henry Jansen Tappan, son of John R. Tappan. Henry was a merchant. He served in the Civil War. It was during the time of his service that his wife opened this home um, for the, to the patriotic ladies of Kingston as a place to prepare bandages and knitted apparel for the Union Army. It wasn't always easy for the Tappan family to maintain the home or to keep it in the family. The Tappans took in boarders, but by 1867, the mortgage was foreclosed. Another Tappan family member stepped forward to try to save the home. Her name was Eliza Tappan Starr. She purchased the home and owned it until her death in 1888, but she never lived here. She lived in Westchester County. The house was likely empty or housing boarders during, the, during this period. The property was rescued once again by a Tappan family member in 1896. John Rudolph Kenyon purchased the home from the estate of his mother's sister, Eliza Tappan. The home had fallen into disrepair by this time. Although Kenyon owned the home for 11 years, his residence was on Fair Street. He never lived in the home either. So when we look at this um, picture, we can tell that it was kind of abandoned and sad looking and derelict. We see, um, I'm not sure if one of the windows might be broken. Some of the shutters are closed, some are open. The fence is missing some pieces and um, it's not looking very good at this time. During this period, Mrs. Westinghouse of the uh, wealthy Westinghouse family lived across the street, across Green Street, in the large Elmendorf mansion. She wanted the city to demolish this decrepit Tappan house so she could have a park across the street from her home. She offered to import and pay for a fancy European marble statue for the centerpiece of the park she envisioned on that triangle in front of her house. Fortunately, the Wiltwick chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution was looking for a home to purchase for their chapter house at this time. John Rudolph Kenyon sold the property to the DAR on July 2nd, 1907 for the sum of $2,300, which converts to about $54,000 in 2015. So I still think he got a bargain, they got a bargain, the DAR. The DAR has owned the house from 1907 to the present time. The National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution was founded October 11, 1890 to promote historic preservation, education, and patriotism. Two years later, the Wiltwick chapter was founded in Kingston by Mary Isabella Forsyth. This is Mary Isabella and her portrait hangs in the back of our room right here tonight. Uh, this portrait shows her wearing a locket with a portrait of her great-grandfather, 
Colonel Jacobus Boone, who was her revolutionary patriot. The locket was hand painted on ivory by Kingston artist John Vanderlyn, and it can be seen today on display in a glass case in the Vanderlyn Room of the Senate House Museum, where the Buried Treasures talks are usually held. So many of the people who attend the talks have probably seen that locket in that glass case. This new DAR chapter held their meetings in the homes of the members until purchasing their chapter house in 1907. They immediately hired young local architect Myron Teller to renovate the old structure. But they had to hold fundraisers and they took contributions to pay for a lot of the work. I found an article in an old newspaper called The Argus dated August 5, 1907. It shows generous contributions from names such as Kirkendall, Clearwater, and Kenyon, among others, to renovate this home. In this article, architect Teller gave a description of how the house will look when renovated. This was invaluable because it's in his words. He describes a dignified colonial doorway with side lights, a porch roof and settees or a Dutch stoop at the entrance. He says he will cover the side door with a roof and make a shed around the side basement entrance. The interior will see more changes. The old Dutch staircase will be replaced with a new broad low stairway with a sweeping curve and a broad landing leading to the second floor rooms. The landing will have a pretty niche with a shell arch and light. Now I have some pictures showing probably just as the DAR purchased the house, it's looking a little better, but we don't see the front porch on it yet, so that's before the renovation was completed. Next I have a, a little better picture looking like this is post-renovation. We can see the front porch on the front. It looks like there's a whitewash on the house at this time as well. Next I have another old picture that um, calls it the Tappan House, and we can see, I can tell it's after the renovation because the front porch is on. I have another old postcard that calls it the DAR House, so we know this was after the renovation as well. And then I have a more modern picture that's showing the little shed around the side cellar door. It's also showing a plaque on the right side of the front that is a memorial placed there by the DAR to the heroic citizens of Kingston because of whose patriotism Kingston was burned. Now I have some interior pictures. This is a picture of the staircase taken from probably the back of this room where we are today looking towards the front door. It's said that Myron Teller designed this staircase with the staircase from George Washington's home Mount Vernon in mind. Here's a better picture of the new staircase that was placed in the front. And now here's a picture of the DAR staircase with a postcard of Mount Vernon on the bottom. And if you look, although it's on opposite sides of the hallway, I really think Myron Teller did use that as his inspiration for the staircase here. It has the same shape with the rounded piece at the bottom a landing and the same piece that goes up in the other direction to get upstairs. Myron Teller goes on to say that throughout the house the original colonial mantles will be restored and all of the 18 and a half wide roughly hewn white oak floorboards in the front part of the house will be kept intact. The great open fireplace in the kitchen with the Dutch oven will be kept intact as well. He says the old hip roof, originally found on the majority of the more pretentious Dutch colonial houses, will be retained. Now this is a picture of the inside of that hip roof up in the attic. It's showing a structure called purlins that support the apex of that hip roof. That's an ancient structure from our attic. Next I have a picture of that structure sitting on the stone wall upstairs in the attic. The next I have a picture of part of that structure with someone pointing to one of the wooden pegs um, holding that structure together. There, it was put together with wooden pegs back in the ancient times. 
Next picture is a picture taken down in the basement of this home showing the older part where the basement walls are rounded. Now I have some photos post Myron Teller of the interior. This is the parlor, which would be the room here. Next I have a 1913 picture of the dining room. Next I have a 1913 picture from the New York State Archives of the newly renovated kitchen. Next I have a picture of the meeting room where I'm speaking to you from tonight. And the same chandelier is here tonight. This one was originally a gas lit chandelier. And next, a picture of that plaque that's on the front of the home dedicated to the citizens of Kingston. Now by 1908, the renovation was complete and the DAR began opening their home to the public for special events. The biggest event in Kingston that year was the celebration of the 250th anniversary of its founding. To celebrate the event, Kingston leaders planned to bring the remains of George Clinton, first New York State Governor and former Vice President of the United States, back to town for reburial in the Old Dutch Church Cemetery. And this is a picture of Clinton's remains on a ship getting ready to bring back to Kingston. He had died as Vice President in Washington, D.C. in 1812. He was buried in the Washington Congressional Cemetery. His remains and monument were brought back to Ulster County by ship, um, and on the way, they passed each city along the Hudson. Uh, oh, there were great ceremonies in Washington and New York City first, and then cannons boomed as the ship passed each city along the Hudson River on its way up to Kingston. When it got to Kingston, there was a great parade as they um, brought the body up from the river to the Old Dutch Church Cemetery. And this is a carriage in that parade where we can see um, in the back seat on the left side, New York State Governor Charles Evans Hughes, who became in the future United States Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he rode in the parade with Samuel Kirkendall, who was on the right side of that picture. They got off their carriage at Academy Green and they reviewed the rest of the parade as it went by and then all of the people made their way to the Old Dutch Churchyard where the um, governor's remains were buried and even his monument came up from Washington DC. That was like a state of the art monument for the time and that um, I have read how many tons it weighed and I, I can't remember offhand but it was a very large monument to move and it was considered extremely um, advanced for the times because it does have an engraved picture of um, George Clinton on that monument which is still in the Dutch Church Cemetery today. After the burial, Governor Hughes and all the distinguished guests were received here for a reception at the chapter house by the DAR. They were all loud in the praises of the home and charmed to be in such an historic atmosphere. In 2012, the 200th anniversary of Clinton's death was commemorated with another celebration in Kingston and once again we came back to the DAR house and held a, re a reception for the people who attended that event. The DAR continues to meet and work in their chapter house. They continue to open their home for occasional civic events and celebrations they hold public event events, honor students who participate in their historical essay contests, and they assist in genealogical research within the home. This house was built under the reign of an English king. It served as a home for many families and as a place of business for many owners. It played a part in the history of New York State, the American Revolution, and it helped Union soldiers during the Civil War. Today, the home continues to be owned and cared for by the Wiltwick chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. It's a perfect place for a society organized for the purpose of preserving history, education, and patriotism to meet and keep history alive. So on behalf of the DAR this evening, I would like to invite you to take a walk through the house before leaving, and thank you so much for coming.
Nancy, thank you so much. That was, that was uh, an incredible tale of one of the more amazing houses and buildings in historic uptown Kingston. This really is, when we say it's the cornerstone of Kingston's history, it really is, and you can see that. And Nancy did an incredible amount of work on this, an absolutely incredible amount of work, uh, and she found things that no one had known before. She really delved into it, and we're fortunate to have all that information now, we've recorded, so 100 years from now, they're gonna be able to know what Nancy did, and, and we're all appreciative. So Nancy, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions for Nancy? Where does the DAR get its funding to maintain this house, Nancy? Well, we have um, some endowments, and um, we have some fundraisers now and then, and so we're very careful about maintaining the home and taking care of it. And I would recommend that everybody, if you haven't had a chance to take a walk through uh, the home after, it's a, it's a, this is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful building, and what the DAR has done here uh, to maintain it and to improve it and everything that's, that's contained in here. It, it's absolutely beautiful, so I, I highly recommend you take advantage of it. It really is one of the, one of the real gems of Uptown Kingston. And uh, I will tell you, as Nancy referred to the 2012 George Clinton celebration, this lecture series is a direct offshoot of that. Uh, and it was wonderful to have, it was a wonderful way to end the day by coming here and being able to walk through this beautiful building. Any other questions? None at all? Let me check the other room. I'd just like to point out the deeds once again. It was a very interesting process for me to go up to the county building and um, go step by step through all of the owners and take those, I made copies and took them home so I could study them and uh, then do the genealogy of the owners and get their story. And um, some of them are a little difficult to read. And uh, unfortunately, I think some of the students in the future may not even be able to read because cursive writing isn't taught like it, it used to be. But the beautiful script of people who were writing these de deeds in those old days are really a sight to see. Uh, and that's why I wanted to put a couple of them on the PowerPoint for you to see some of that today. Is this, is this open to the public? Is this building ever open to the public? Okay, I'm back. There was a question. Uh, there was a question over there, and the question was, is the building ever open to the public? Um, yes, it's open to the public by um, appointment if you would like to bring a tour or for school children or something like that. But it's open to the public at least a couple of times a year. The DAR usually has a Sunday afternoon in February. We have what we call a George Washington tea. And that's when some of our students who have won an essay contest will come in and they'll read their essays to the people who come, and there's usually a little notation in the Freeman that we'll have an open house that Sunday afternoon. We also sometimes have a gala at the holiday season in December, and um, we, we put little notes in the paper if the house is open, and that would usually be on a Sunday afternoon as well. So if you ever see that there's a little notation about the house being open, please come. We always have tea and refreshments, and um, we're always looking for more people to come in and enjoy the beautiful home that we call our chapter house. And I don't know if Nancy said it, but Nancy is actually a descendant of Christopher Tappan, correct? Well, yes. Um, kind of my, my patriot for the revolution was his cousin. So I'm not a direct descendant down from Christopher, but um, my patriot was Christopher's cousin. I had a great grandmother, Mary T. Tappan. And Christopher Tappan was a subject of our lecture series. If you recall, the Ulster County Clerk Nina Pasupak did a wonderful presentation on Christopher Tappan, the father of John Tappan. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the deputy uh, county commissioner, or uh, deputy Ulster County Clerk under George Clinton, who was his brother-in-law uh, for many years, became county clerk after the passing of George Clinton. Uh, so the, the Tappan family, which is related to the Livingstons, are really one of our, one of Kingston's royalty. Um, so it is a very special bond that Nancy has with the building. Do we have any other questions? No? 
Okay. Well, Nancy, thank you again. Thank you thank so you. much thank for this for presentation. Coming. After all that work, I'm glad somebody came. You want to put the next one up? Uh, and if you liked what you saw with Nancy today, Nancy is actually going to be doing another presentation uh, for the Hurley Heritage Society uh, about the Hurley Rooster, which is an auction. They're auctioning off the Hurley Roosters. If you, I guess, if you've seen them around Hurley, that that her talk is going to be September 24th at 7 p.m. at the Hurley Reformed Church at Main Street in, in Hurley, and then they're going to be having the auction Sunday. Uh, September 27th. So if you're around, you'll be able to get a second crack at Nancy. Um, and again, we do want to thank all the people who make this possible. We want to thank Nancy. Nancy, I will tell you, she did an incredible amount of work. All of our speakers do such a wonderful job in researching these subjects for us. And we all have the benefit of them. And again, it's wonderful that we record these so that they're safe for posterity. It would be a shame to have all the effort that was that was expended on these lectures lost. So Nancy, thank you so much. And we thank the DAR for opening up the house for us tonight. It's a wonderful opportunity to come in. And again, I do, re I highly recommend that you take advantage of, of a, take a quick tour. Do you have a website, Nancy? The question is, is there a website for the DAR? Yes, the DAR has a website. The DAR does have a website. If you get on the DAR, and this is actually the Wiltwick chapter of the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, again, we want to thank all the people who publicize the event. Hugh Reynolds in it uh, always does a wonderful spread, and uh, there's really so many people. You can't, we can't name them all. Chester does a wonderful job on uh, his Facebook page. So we thank everybody who's done that. Uh, everybody involved with the Kingston Berry Treasures. I, w I want to take a special opportunity to thank uh, Tom Curran and everybody at the Senate House. They bought a lot of the chairs over here. They bring all the screens over. Whether we have this lecture at the Senate House or not, they are an integral part of that. Bob Rizzo, who does all the recordings, and Bob, if you want a copy of this uh, lecture, you can get it from him. And he has every single lecture we've done for over three years. And Bob came over here a few days ago to set up, and it, it, it's an awful lot, so we thank him. Uh, and we thank all of you. This would not be possible without all of you. We thank you for your support. We thank you for everything you do to make this such a wonderful series. And we, uh, we hope we continue to see you. And I'll, we have a couple one uh, lectures coming up next month, uh, October 16th. We are actually going to talk about General Robert W. Hasbrook, who was really one of the heroes of the Battle of Bulge. We think of the Battle of, Bul of the Bulge. We think of uh, uh, Patton. But Robert Hasbrook was also a hero of the Battle of the, Barge, uh, the Bulge, and his son, Robert Hasbrook Jr., is going to come talk about him. He was a Kingston resident. He was cousin for Sherman Hasbrook, who was another general. Uh, he was an amazing man, and we're going to hear all about him. He was actually the commanding officer for Robert Dietz, uh, Kingston's uh, Congressional Medal of Honor winner. And on November 13th, we're going to learn about the New York State Constitutional Convention, which occurred in the Ulster County Courthouse. Uh, the speaker is going to be uh, Judge Albert Rosenblatt, who is a retired Court of Appeals judge. Pretty impressive. That the Court of Appeals is the highest court in New York State. I've only met a couple uh, Court of Appeals judges in my lifetime, and I will tell you, Judge Rosenblatt is by far the nicest. He's a <laughs> wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, so he's going to be here with us in November. And I, I would like to also remind people, if you, ha if you didn't hear, uh, if you remember Professor Ray Raymond, who came, he was one of our speakers here. He talked about John Jay. He runs the uh, Constitutional, the Institute for Constitutional Studies at SUNY Ulster. They have a wonderful lecture series there. There's going to be a lecture on Monday night, September 28th, on the Bill of Rights, the fight to secure American liberty. So hopefully everyone can make that. That's going to be at 6.30 p.m. at the uh, College Lounge in Vanderlyn Hall. So again, we thank you. We hope to see you next month. We hope you take advantage of the, uh, the DAR's generous offer for a tour of the house. And have a wonderful weekend, everyone.